Welcome to An Author's Journey, where a prominent author chats with us about their journey as a writer. I'm your host, Joe Pizzo. Today's special featured guest is author Padma Venkatraman, who may be best known for her book, The Bridge Home, which was featured as a global read aloud book for 2019. According to Goodreads.com, The Bridge Home is a tug at your heart story of friendship, resilience, and survival. I can tell you from personal experience that my class and I read this novel, and my seventh grade students laughed and cried right along with the characters. Nevertheless, this accomplished author did not start out as an author. Padma immigrated on her own to the U.S. from India via England when she was a mere 19 years of age. She served as a chief scientist on some research vessels in Germany and directed a school in England. She also worked in a laboratory at Johns Hopkins University and obtained her doctorate in oceanography at the College of William and Mary. A Time to Dance is the first novel in verse written in English by a South Asian author. Padma's next two books, Island's End and Climbing the Stairs, have received numerous awards, including the South Asia Book Award, the Patterson Prize, and the Julia Ward Howe BAC Award. Awards given for The Bridge Home include an ALA Notable Book Award, a Walter Award from We Need Diverse Books, the South Asia Book Award, the SCBWI Golden Kite Award, and others. By the way, she also has 20 books published in India. Padma presents speeches at many universities, including Harvard, and commencement speeches at various schools. She serves as a panelist at events including the Penn World Voices Festival, and she has been the keynote speaker at national and international conferences and literary festivals, including the NCTE ALAN 2019 Conference, the James River Writers Conference, and the SLJ Day of Dialogue 2019. A teacher and mentor of other writers, Padma has taught numerous workshops all over the world. She has conducted workshops about writing poetry and novels in verse. In addition, she has taught workshops featuring plot, including most notably a workshop at Highlights Foundation on this subject, together with Grace Lynn. And I must point out that many of Padma's poems have been published in Poetry Magazine as well. Padma's next novel, Born Behind Bars, will be released on September 7th, 2021 from Nancy Paulson Books, Penguin Random House. And the genre of this novel is kind of a combination of prose and verse. It is indeed an honor to welcome Padma Venkatraman to an author's journey today. Padma, it's great to have you here. Thank you. The honor is all mine. And I, I really mean that. I'm just so overwhelmed, so um, so full of gratitude to be here today. Thank you. Well, we appreciate you taking your time to chat with us. And let me go ahead and start with this first question to begin our author's journey. I want to thank you, first of all, for The Bridge Home. As I mentioned in the introduction, my students were deeply moved by the struggles your characters faced and the courage your characters displayed as they became an ad hoc family. And I can remember my students, boys and girls alike, 12, 13 year olds in tears in some of the spots and laughing out loud in other spots. But we all wondered, what was your inspiration for writing The Bridge Home? The inspiration came from a very personal place and it was probably one of my hardest novels to write because of that. Um, you know, the novel, as you know, begins with an incident of uh, domestic violence. And unfortunately, I have um, experienced uh, violence and uh, violent men um, in my family when I was young. And that was a very difficult thing. And I think that's why I didn't write about that for such a long time. And then finally, there came the time that I felt like I had to be able to write this story. But this, that, although that part came from my life, 
Um, the other part came from the lives of friends that I had. So I was born into a very wealthy, very privileged family in India. But when I was about eight years old, my parents split up and suddenly my mother and I had nothing. And we were in this tiny, I shouldn't say nothing because we, you know, she was educated she was able to fall back on that to get herself a job. And even though she had zero in the bank account, was able to rent a tiny apartment. And so we did have so much more than so many others. And what to me was amazing, is amazing about my mother is that as a rich woman, as a wealthy woman, she had given a lot of money to charity. She could no longer do that, but she gave time even though she was working so hard to keep a roof over our head and put food on our table, she made sure that she volunteered at places where children like the ones that you see in the bridge home studied. And uh, through that interaction, because obviously there was no babysitter, there was you know, no, <laughs> nowhere else I could go. I, um, I went with her and then I met and uh, was very lucky to be befriended by these children who had gone through so much worse than I was going through and were just able to laugh with me. And I think that was something that was so important when I was writing this uh, novel was, you know, it was a, my childhood was not one that I would wish on anybody. It had moments that were just, you know, terrifying and too hard to talk about. Uh, but then again, uh, there were these moments when I could see that these children had been through far worse because they did not have anyone at all. And they were able to laugh. And the fact that we were able to laugh together in the best way, not at someone, not cruel laughter, but just sort of draw the weave, you know, just that um, was very important to me. So I felt like uh, that was something that I really wanted to bring out in the novel. And I was so touched when you said that your uh, kids laughed and cried. Uh, when they when you read the novel out to them, and uh, I I will say this so there's there was one girl in particular Indra, who told me uh, that she had ended up staying in a graveyard to escape men who wanted to enslave her, because unfortunately even today children uh, are enslaved people are enslaved, and uh, she ran away and she hid in a graveyard to escape them. And she told me, after she told me the story, she said, Padma, will you write my story one day? Because I was always scribbling in books. And I promised her, I said, yes, I will. And this book is that promise. It seems very evident that you were close to the situations in this book because they came across so realistically. They didn't seem as, as if they were contrived it didn't seem as if it was written by someone who read about these things, but never really experienced them. There's, there's an authenticity in, in not just the way the characters are portrayed, but in the conversations they have and in the worries that they fret about and the little things that, that can sometimes paralyze and overwhelm someone who is unsure of what the next day will bring uh, and sometimes what the next moment will bring. Right. So I, I Oh, that's so beautifully put. I'm going to change the direction just a little bit now because we don't want to be too sad. No. As I mentioned in the intro today, uh, you didn't start out with a vision to pursue a career in writing. And my students, as well as I wonder, when did you know that you wanted to pursue writing as a career? So uh, the answer to that is that I knew when I was really little. And uh, my mother says that when I was five years old, I was already, or even three, actually. The first poem that she has for me was when I was three years old. And I couldn't even actually write. But I, came, I would tell her, apparently, that I would hear these poems in my head and I would dictate them to her. And I was very... Um, very insistent that the line breaks should be in a certain place. So I would say, okay, now stop writing that line. And then the next line, and she was astonished. And even I am astonished because now I think forever about where I should break the line. And it's such an, but apparently my three-year-old wisdom 
never doubted myself and just went <laughs> as children do. Um, and so, you know, I had, I think uh, I had this love of uh, poetry very young and in those early times, I definitely thought that I would be a writer. Then when, you know, everything happened and I started to realize how vital it was for a woman, especially a woman uh, growing up in India, it was even more obvious to me that my mother's education was what saved us, saved her. And I was determined that I needed to do something that would give, give me a real job that would make money, that would give me something steady. And quite strangely, because I did not see people of color, women of color as scientists, I certainly didn't. I did see men, obviously, Indian men as scientists, not, not, not women, not in books, not in real life. And I you know, wasn't told that, that I could have a career and so on. But I think deep inside, just knowing that my mother had done it um, made me think I could. And and somehow I could not see myself making a steady, steady paycheck if I wrote. And so in, I knew somehow that, that and in the older I got, the more obvious it was to me that that would not necessarily give me a financial stability immediately. And so I said, I will do science because I loved science as well. And I loved mathematics and I loved the environment. And even all those years ago, it's very, very obvious to me that we were not treating it correctly. Uh, our earth so when when you wrote the bridge home that obviously from what you've said came from your own personal inner experience have all your books reflected your personal experience uh or, or just was it the, the bridge home i think the bridge home took for, or, or uh went to perhaps some of the hardest places but uh, Climbing the Stairs, which was my first um, novel, was one that actually uh, is about my mother growing up in India in the 1940s, uh, because, you know, she's much older than me. She never expected to have me. I was a bit of a shock. <laughs> and so um, she grew up when the British were ruling India. And it was such a very different uh, time. And, you know, she would speak about uh, going to places and seeing signs that said Indians and dogs not allowed. Uh, or, you know, it wasn't even the word Indians. It was another word, which was really not a nice word. So I'm not going to say it, but it was uh, that sort of a thing that she grew up under. And then she saw India have, you know, uh, uh, Gandhiji and all of these people fight and, you know, uh, fight for freedom and get freedom um, nonviolently. And yet she also uh, grew up at a time when uh, there was so much, there still is, but at that time, some blatant caste oppression, a very blatant uh, treatment of women that was just awful as well, you know, very uh, treated very much as second class citizens. So in Climbing the Stairs, it's literally about a young girl growing up, wanting to just climb the literal stairs to go from downstairs to upstairs where the library is in her home and not being able to do that because she is female and only men are allowed to go upstairs and take books out of the library in the home. And so, you know, obviously my mother did climb those stairs and if she hadn't done that, I might not have been here today. So, so it's about that, but it's also about um, my grand uncle and uh, people who served at, in the Allied force in the Second World War. And unfortunately, we do not give people of color who served in the Allied forces enough credit, uh, you know, whether they come from India or they come from our nation. I mean, America, we have not also fully recognized um, all of those people of color that so deserve recognition, the indigenous soldiers, the Japanese American soldiers, the um, you know, Latinx, the uh, African-American soldiers, so many of them did so much and then got treated so badly when they came back after being war heroes. Hopefully we change that moving forward. Uh, I agree. Yes. That's, that's something that we really do need to address. Yeah. Yeah. When you write your novels, do you do a lot of research on the novels? Does it depend on what the subject is, or it, 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 I, I don't see you as someone who writes formula novels. I, you don't impress <laughs> me that way. I see you more as somebody with inspiration who then gives shape to whatever is inspiring you. 
Yeah. So um, actually, it's interesting you say that because that's, you know, sometimes I I feel a little inadequate because I feel like I'm not churning out the novels perhaps as fast as I should be or something. But for me, every novel begins with a voice that I hear and I hear this voice so well. And then I start to see this movie in my mind. And then I feel like there are ghosts in my home just sort of haunting me and then finally really possessing me so much. So I start to dream not as if I'm seeing a scene, but I'm dreaming as if I'm inside a character. I dream as though I'm Vigi in the bridge home watching something happen. I dream as though I'm someone. And in that small space of wakefulness between, uh, you know, when the dream ends and when I get up and know I'm Padma, uh, there is something that goes on. And I think that's when I know that a, a novel is really under my skin. And so I think that's a very sort of organic process, a process that's driven so much by characters um, that that obsess, uh, uh, maybe I obsess about them um, and that possess me, yeah. Now, in your new book, Born Behind Bars, we've said that this is kind of a combination of prose and verse, which is uh, an interesting combination. Why have you chosen to write this in this style rather than saying, I could just simply do this in prose and it would be a lot easier than combining prose and verse? Or is there a certain music that you hear, a certain melody, a certain pattern that is going to be used to fit different situations in the book? Yeah, I think it was so, uh, you know, the first, um, the first part of it, what I could see, the first scene is this, this little boy looking at, this really high window in jail because he's born in jail. That's all he knows. He's never seen anything else. And him, you know, him and his thoughts just flying out of that window and trying to imagine the whole world and that yearning to be out there. Somehow there's something in that that just was so emotional. And I felt as if if I just wrote prose, it might end up being that that strength of that emotion I wanted everywhere. And somehow I felt like poems could distill that emotion. And yet, if I were to write it as a novel in verse, I think these days, a lot of people, Nikki Grimes and I, uh, you know, spoke about this. A lot of people say novel in verse and they write what ends up being, you know, sometimes phenomenal stories, but nevertheless, not really verse um, and not really poetry. And I wanted to not do that. So I wanted to make sure that if I did something that it would be really poetic or if I was going to call it a novel in verse. And I just felt that I just, this character did not speak to me in full verse. He spoke to me lyrically. And there was poetry in the way he spoke, but it was not uh, it was not fully poetry. It was not fully verse. And then I realized there are, there's such a thing as prose poetry. And I started to read more and more. And um, one of my friends, actually, uh, author friends, Peter Johnson, is somebody who was, uh, I think, the editor of the International Prose Poetry Journal. So he was very, I mean, he, you know, uh, even with the pandemic and everything else, has been very, you know, uh, distantly helpful and had a long time ago given me uh, volumes of prose poetry and said, you know, this is what it is, you can do this. And that and uh, Sandra Cisneros, uh, House on Mango Street yes. is arguably a prose poem too. And I think those were in my mind. And so um, I loved, you know, when I got the, the, the arcs are few and far between the season, but just the way that a prose poem is formatted is the way that the paragraphs are formatted in this and just so much white space, which I think needed to be there for the emotion, because I feel like sometimes uh, if you really polish, at, at least with me, when I polish my work, what I want is for that white space to speak, for the emotion to sort of seep into that white space so that it resonates and it's full. And I think that happens um, with this. But so, yeah, so I wanted it to be kind of a little bit of both. And that's why it's written in sort of prose poetry. Now, you've 
given a really wonderful explanation. You've made me think of some things. Do you play a musical instrument at all? <laughs> you know, I do. It's called the Vina. I should say I used to, quite honestly, because I learned it when I was little from a person who was an amazing teacher uh, to me. And she actually never took a cent she, or a paisa, I should say, because I was in India at the time. And my mother wouldn't have been able to afford uh, music lessons for me, but I just loved her. I heard her music and she allowed me to, she didn't even allow me. She insisted that I should take classes with her without uh, any pay at all. And uh, she is actually the teacher that in a way shows up in A Time to Dance, uh, my novel in verse, because of course that's about dance. Uh, and she taught me music. She taught me this seven stringed musical instrument, but uh, that, a Carnatic music tradition is what Veda in a time to dance dances. So I think that sense of music has always been part of my life. But if I were to pick up a Veena now, I would be awful. <laughs> and uh, I was not terribly musically talented. I love music. But. but I think that love of music comes through. And the fact that you can hear it, you may not necessarily be able to play it. I know I surely can't. But I can hear it. And sometimes if, if I'm writing something or if a student's writing something, I'll sit back and say, I hear elements of rap or I hear elements of jazz or there are certain rhythms that keep repeating themselves. And, and whether you play the, the instrument or not, I think as long as you have the appreciation of the music that it can infuse into your writing. And I see that in, in your writing, especially with making the the move into a a novel that's partly verse and partly prose that you've you've created sort of a uh, a combination of new age and jazz and fusion and, and and different things that that have come together and maybe it's it's a different melody i don't know that it's a new melody but it's a different melody but the melody from what i'm hearing from you was done to fit the subject matter and the direction that it may not have turned out the same. It may not have been as effective. Is, is that accurate? I think so. Um, I try to write as true as I can to the characters that I hear in my head. And also, you know, when I revise, I certainly do think of uh, the young people that I'm writing for, because I think that is a great responsibility that we bear. So uh, in that revision stage, I certainly do think about them and my responsibility to tell the story in a way that is not watered down at all and is really imbued with that emotion and that gut punch uh, needs to be there because I think otherwise I'm telling them a lie. And I don't want to write if, you know, um, I absolutely love fantasy, but this book is not fantasy and I want it to have that real um, honest truth and brutality if there is brutality, but I don't want the brutality necessarily for the age group that I'm writing for to be on screen. I want it to be such that an adult reading it gets the full picture, but a young person who is perhaps um, joyfully not yet exposed to this kind of uh, horror does not need to see it on screen. And uh, so then they only take away the, you know, the feelings, but they don't need to have the uh, grotesque details unless they're old enough. It's nice that, that you, you recognize the need for subtlety. Right. The need for addressing different audiences different ways. Uh, it would limit your novels tremendously in terms of the opportunity to bring them into schools if they had things that were a bit too blatant or a bit too graphic. Um, I know that there are authors who think that the, the amount of profit increases by the amount of graphic nature that's in the book. And I think that's short-lived at best because quality lasts over time it's it's not a flash it's 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 more uh, a stream that just keeps flowing and and is there and is doing what it's supposed to do and it's carrying life within it 
I think there's also a challenge. I see it as a challenge to myself as a writer to be able to evoke the emotion without necessarily showing everything on screen. Um, so, you know, it's almost an artistic challenge for me to say. And sometimes the first draft, which is a complete mess, might have a lot. It may have a lot of explicit, horrible stuff going on, but I take that out. I've written through it and I just, I can kick it out. When you write, do you find that you have ideas of characters in your mind, then you write a scene or a story to fit the characters? Does it work in reverse that you have uh, the scene in mind and you create characters to fit those scenes or, or the, the plot line? Is it a combination? Does it depend on what, what the subject is? Th th those are, I know, tough decisions for writers to make. I actually think it's a uh, it's a bit of a combination in that the character is first born in my mind without a doubt. And I think I have to, in fact, it's not even first the character. I want to say voice. Mm -hmm. It's the first thing that I hear is the voice. And it's for me, it's it that's where it starts. And of course, the voice is a character, you know. Uh, but for me, voice and character are just so much. Character is voice, voice is character for me. And when I hear that voice and then it starts to strengthen and strengthen, the character is coming with it into me. And, um, and you know, then I start to see the character and so on. And, and then I start to understand the character. And then I, I realize what the character, the challenges that face the character the trauma that the character perhaps is going through and the yearning that the character has, all of it comes to me. And that is where the plot is born almost organically because uh, that character to be that person has this that is happening to them. And that that's happening to them is of course the plot. <laughs> uh, now when and you, you know, sometimes I can see the character at the beginning of the movie of the uh, movie in my mind and I see them at the end of the movie in my mind. And I kind of know, know what happened. Like I can see the first and the last scene. I know the emotional arc then, and then the rest falls into place. Does that happen more often than not? Yes. And so I don't often write in order. I often write out of order. I have the first scene and then, um, I often do have the first scene first, and then I see the last scene, and then I see something else in the middle, which is often the climax. And then the little things start to sort of slowly fall in place, and uh, I arrange them before I send them to my editor. And that's something maybe for young writers to recognize that not every writer has a cookie cutter formula, do this first, this second, this third, this fourth, have this when you go to the publisher, know these things, Sometimes you have to look at yourself as an artist and say, this is what I do. And, and this is my style. And maybe it doesn't fit everybody. Maybe there are only certain publishers who would even consider this. But this is the way I do things. And that's a difficult decision, I would guess, to, to have to make if, if you're just starting out, because you don't know which direction to turn. Right. And especially when I was starting out, which is now about 15 years ago, I think. Um, anyway, it was a long time ago and it was before We Need Diverse Books. And it was so hard as a beginning writer of color, um, you know, writing books that were set in uh, India to actually be, you know, get to get my foot in the door was not easy. So I had about 40 rejections, which is something else. Between 30 and 40, I say 40, my husband says 30, but you know, we agreed that it's somewhere there, at least 31. And I always, whenever I speak to young people, I always say, listen, if I had given up that 29th time, yeah. I wouldn't be a writer today. Yeah. Perseverance is the key. I, I agree. Now, when you were growing up, you said that you, you did a little writing and you enjoyed at the age of three doing some poetry. Was there an author that you liked to read back then? There were, and there were so many. Uh, yesterday, was it yesterday? Uh, anyway, a few days ago, I had somebody ask me um, what the influences were in my mother tongue, which I thought was so interesting. And there, was, there is this person called Piruvalluvar, a uh, poet. And what to me 
was always amazing about his poetry was the sound of it, which was very musical. And the fact that when I looked at it, it's very, very tiny. Um, it's tinier than a haiku. It's just, yeah. Uh, you know, it, they just, it's, it's like two phrases almost. Yeah. And the, the bottom phrase is just like four words. And the top phrase, I think, is five. So it's like, it's so short. Um, yeah, actually, seven words. Um, so it's, yeah, and it's seven, with seven words, he does so much. And then when people try to, like, tell you what the poem means, they write at least a paragraph. If they have to translate it, it goes on. You know, I have not seen anyone. Nobody can else, else can do it that way. And yet he manages to pack so much. And, you know, uh, and to me, it, I think very early on, even if I couldn't understand, which I didn't, I couldn't understand everything that he was writing about. What impressed me was that somehow there was this magic between the lines. There was something there with so little um, text. And the idea of, uh, of writing in a way that is powerful, in a way that is spare, but not sparse, has been really important to me. Which doesn't mean that I don't, you know, I also love sort of luxuriating and, and sometimes I just do that too. So sometimes, you know, I, I like to write luxurious prose uh, that is evocative and, you know, uh, you know, sensuous and um, incorporates all of that. But I also really love uh, raising or rising to the challenge of doing something that is tight and really, uh, like I said, spare, but not sparse, because if you go too far, then you don't evoke emotion either. And that's a fine line to walk, to know just how much needs to be there. That's, that's the true artist of the minimalist. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I've with my students, and, and they're seventh graders, they're 12, 13 years old, when I've introduced them to the minimalists, I've let them read Fog by Carl Sandburg. And I, I give the background on how that whole thing happened. He was walking down a street in Chicago and yeah. it was a foggy day and this is what he saw and that's what he wrote. Oh, it's so beautiful. Yeah, I talk about William Carlos Williams. We're in New Jersey. Yeah, He's from Patterson. He was a physician. And I tell them, look, you don't have to be a full-time poet to write poetry. This man was a physician during the day. He wrote the poetry on his free time. Exactly. So he relaxed. Yeah, yeah. And Steinbeck, I mean, John um, Steinbeck was a kind of, he tried to be a, a marine scientist. Right. And the log from the Sea of Cortez, I loved that book so much because, you know, you see Doc and, uh, yeah. And Hemingway is an ultimate minimalist. Yes. Do not get a whole lot of description with yeah. Hemingway. We read a story by Hemingway and I point out to the students, there is one paragraph where he really gets into description. And out of the three or four pages of the story, if you miss that one little piece and you're looking for adjectives, well, you're not going to find a lot, but he's describing with images. Right. And that's how a lot of artists can work. And I, I think... Part of what your success is, is you can balance the two. You can put those descriptions in, but you can also use the, the simple details where you become a minimalist. You hold back some of what's there because the detail might overwhelm or the detail might make the note a little too loud or a little too harsh or you know a bit discordant. And right. it doesn't have the same flow. And that's where the true artistry comes in. Yeah. Thank you. And I mean, I think one of the uh, authors that I later on um, started to, I loved. And unfortunately, it's no longer cool to mention his name because he won the Nobel Prize. But when I used to say this, you know, 20 years ago, um, when or 25 years ago when I was writing and people would say to me, uh, who is an, a writer that you really admire? I would say Kasuo Ishigiro. And people would say, who? 
and you know now he won the Nobel Prize. So I try not to use him, but it was such. It, he still is such a, a huge um, factor in my writing life because I think he's always challenged himself. He's pushed himself to try new forms. He's uh, you know pushed the envelope, and he is an Asian writer. I mean, he's Asian British, British Asian, whatever. Um, but I think that you know that meant something to me as well that he came from an Asian tradition and uh, yet was able to do that so eloquently in the English language. Now you have Born Behind Bars coming out on September 9th. And I know your audience is wondering, what's your next novel after Born Behind Bars? (laughs) Uh, I don't really know the answer to that, but I am writing a few different novels right now. Uh-huh. So I'm juggling or I, I'm hearing a few different voices right now. So we will see what comes out. I'm not too, too sure. Uh, I have some ideas, but I don't yet know. Is it typical that you'll have more than one novel going on at a time? Or is this just an anomaly? No, it always happens that I'm writing at least a couple of different things. And then one takes over. Okay. So, yeah. You always go back to the others? I sometimes do. I mean, I think Born Behind Bars was in my head for a while. And uh, I actually, I told uh, my editor, Nancy Paulson, you know, we, have, we were having lunch once and I said to her that I have this, this, this kid in my head, I have this story. And she said, oh, let's see where that goes. And, you know, I could sort of spend more time with him kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And she said, you know, then I, when I sent her a draft, she said, yes. And so, you know, sometimes it's that. Sometimes it's just I hear a few people, but then I, uh, I might draft out a few things. And then she was kind enough to look at a couple of things. And she said, this one, let's go with this. And I feel like by then I know them well enough that if I'm there sitting around wanting them to come to me, they will. Okay. Now, when, when you get one of these ideas... It doesn't sound like there's there's a set formula for time. It might take a year. It might take five years. Is that accurate? Yes. Yes. I mean, I do feel now um, I, uh, you know, the older I get, the more I feel like I have so many ideas. I have so many stories. I want to write them all if God uh, allows me to. And, you know, I want to live a good long time on this earth and finish them all. And uh and so I feel like I, I want some part, sometimes I do feel like I would love to have more time to do more of that and write in a way, I don't want to say faster, but but maybe have novels finished sooner. Uh, but then again, I think the other thing that is really important for me is that I need to, I really respect my family a lot. And I want, I mean, I have one chance in my life to be a mother. And I, that is so important to me and spending time with my daughter, spending time with my uh, husband. I just, those are things that may not come back, even if it's as simple as, you know, I don't know, all of us going for a walk one day or uh, sitting around the dinner table, those moments don't come back. And I think those are extremely important to me. And, you know, I should also say that I, um, I do have um, a, you know, I have depression and anxiety and uh, those, uh, you know, and, you know, somebody said post-traumatic stress, who, whatever, you may call it whatever you like, but the things that have happened to me in my childhood have left impressions. And I need to also take my time to make sure that I look after myself. So I am not one, I'm not an author who is able to even physically and mentally just churn out uh, book after book after book after book, you know? especially not the kind of emotional books that I write. They seem to take a lot out of you from what you're saying. They do. So I'm, I'm guessing there has to be a recovery period then. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, I write a little, I, you know, I'm, I'm hoping those will get published too someday. I write funny stuff that is just all over the place, but somehow my agent doesn't seem to want them, but we're going to have some conversations and I hope very much that those will happen too because they're fluffy and they're nice and they have a place, you know, Sure. they're important too. Now, if you weren't writing, would, would there be something else that you would be doing? 
you know, I can't imagine myself as not a writer. I feel like uh, I write, therefore I am. <laughs> okay. Um, but but I suppose if I wasn't, the, I mean, if I wasn't a published writer, so let's say I would always be writing in my head. I would always be writing in my, on my uh, computer, on in notebooks. I would always be writing. And that's how I see myself. But if I were not getting published and if I could not make money this way and I had to do something else for a job, I think it would be my oceanography because I loved it. And uh, I just really feel strongly about working with uh, the environment and helping. And, you know, people sometimes think of human beings as different from the environment. And I don't. I mean, I think human health related uh, issues are so important to me and the oceans and pollution. Is there a future novel coming that will take advantage of that background? You know, it's so amazing that you said that. I feel like you have sending me your blessing because one of the novel ideas that I have going now and that I really want to finish this summer has exactly that. Because I feel, yeah. Yeah, send me your blessings, please. And I hope I will be able to finish that this summer. I would love to see it when you finish. Yeah. We'll we'll maybe chat about it. Absolutely. I really hope, like I said, with your blessings, I hope I finish it. I just, because I I realize that I have the expertise and the sort of in-depth understanding of science that I can bring in uh, and write hopefully lyrically as well about it. Final question. There are folks who are listening to this right now who want to become practicing published authors. And I know there's no set formula and it's different for everybody, but they're always looking for advice on what do I do? How do I get started? Where do I go? Uh, is there anything you can tell them that might make the journey a little bit less daunting? Sure. One very practical bit of advice. There are a lot of people out there who want, are like, um, who want your money. So don't, I don't think you should give money to get published. You shouldn't give money to anybody who is pretending to be an agent. An agent makes money from whatever they sell of yours. And uh, editors as well pay you for what you write. So I think that's very important to just protect yourself and be uh, very sensible about that and not not pay to get published. Uh, and if somebody's asking for money, then then they're a bit weird. So, you know, don't go there. I think that's a very practical thing. And uh, it, On another note, though, one of the things that I think is so important to me is to ask, why do you want to write? And answer that question uh, to yourself in the most honest way. And for me, I write because I feel that uh, I'm I'm deeply um, in the best spiritual space when I write. For me, writing is about compassion. It is about compassionate inquiry. It's about compassionate imagination. It is about uh, opening, you know, when you open the door of a book, sorry, if you open the page of a book, it's like opening a door that that really in your heart is the door of compassion. And I think that's what I want. And I think if compassion can be your compass as a writer, then you can start to see the world it collaboratively, cooperatively, and uh, not worry and not constantly compare yourself and uh, you know, and uh, compete all the time or whatever, because at the end of the day, it's very subjective. And, you know, I am so, so deeply grateful for everything that I've received, but there are several things that I haven't yet received. And, and may ne- you know, and material uh, rewards, there's no guarantee, however fabulous a book you may write, there's no guarantee you will get any kind of recognition. You may not even get published. Um, and so I think that knowing that, why would you want to write? That's a question that you should ask yourself and then do it, I think, for the love of it and for the love of others and for the love of the earth. That's wonderful advice for any profession, really. If you're doing what you love to do, you never spend a day at work. You're, you're, you're doing things that you find are very rewarding. Yeah. Padma, you have been so generous with your time. And I want to say thank you so much for spending time with us. Ladies and gentlemen, we've been chatting with Padma Venkatraman, and we are extraordinarily blessed that you've taken this author's journey with us today, and we all appreciate your kindness. 
Thank you so very much. I'm just so happy to be here. And uh, thank you. Thank you for everything that you do uh, for the whole writing community. Thank you. It's a pleasure. And for all the children that you teach. Well, They're you. the most important. Yes, they are to me as well. Well, folks, that concludes our journey for this day. Tune in again for more conversations with more authors of interest. For an author's journey, I'm your host, Joe Pizzo. Have a wonderful day.